So, welcome to the third Antidipus reading group. Um, this group, we were covering pages 32 to 50 uh, from the edition, which is linked in the, in the, in the channel. Um, this leads us up to the start of chapter two. So, we'll be starting for chapter two next week. Um, and be because of that, because this is sort of our last entry within the first chapter here which covers a lot of really dense um ideas and topics such as the desire machine the body without organs desire in general machines the idea of holes and parts which we'll probably cover in this section um and sort of use this i think probably best is to use this section to overview the pages that we are we're looking at here which are actually less complicated than the ones we were looking at last time but also use this session to basically if anyone's not feeling too comfortable with the topics that we've covered so far and any of the connections we've covered so far use it as a way to just overview these again but one thing um i want to start with is just the ideas that i put forward in the channel um yesterday so there's this the one of the quotes in this section is a machine maybe be a machine may be defined as a system of interruptions or breaks now, once again, we are talking about virtualities, and this is why there was sort of the overview of actuality and virtuality so early on, is because it just comes up time and time again as this sort of implicit structure from which a lot of things are happening, or at least from which a lot of things can be understood. And with this idea of a machine or machinism or machinization, or later on the machinic unconscious, especially where it with regards to Guattari, th this is sort of an understanding of connections and communications and networking. Um, and the idea that what is machined is the machine is this form of virtual connections and two machine is in that way. And this is still real. Um, so don't think of actual machines in terms of um, sort of, um, industry and components and things along these lines now one of the interesting questions that I think um, is happening here especially in the section the whole and its parts is with regards to this idea of, of an origin because everything is within a cut and a flow and I believe it's later on I can't remember exactly where but of course we'll cover it um, Deleuze and Guattari state that there's no such thing as a beginning because if you have this beginning then it's already implicitly a middle of something the beginning had to have a beginning so there's no such thing as beginnings for Deleuze and Guattari and time is due to virtuality is non-linear so everything is this middle of a process and so in terms of cuts and interruptions you're already you're always interrupting a middle to create another middle so in that sense you can see how a rhizome or a multiplicity of multiplicities sorts of sort of spirals out if you have a if you have a flow and it gets cut, that spirals off into something else, which also gets cut. And you can begin to see it sort of like a, how a virus spreads out and t t touches itself to different nodes, which then cut and interrupt other things. Um, so this idea of sort of an originary flow is completely lost. Um, and this, I read it as, is because for Deleuze, and I think by sort of proxy here, the underlying philosophy that's going on with in relation to this idea of a cut and a flow is to do with Lucretian atomism. And if you think of a flow in terms of Lucretius, this is as soon as you... One understanding of Lucretius is that initially there is this lamina flow, this plane of atoms which are all moving in one direction. And from this one thing spirals off and begins something new. Now, of course, that in terms of an originary state can be understood as this sort of uh, origin of everything. Um, but also, if you think that, if you understand that you have a striated or coherent flow, that too is acting like the lamina plane, like it has the way in which it is the same in every direction. All the atomic flows are flowing in the same way in the sense that it creates this coherency. Now, if one little thing, one little atom spirals off and begins to change it, that is the cut and the interruption there um, speaking in terms of Lucretian atomism. So you have this cut and that then begins to birth something completely new. So this isn't always a sense of, you know, there's an easy way to think of it in your head if uh, 
if a line gets cut and spirals off into or, or breaks off into another line which then gets cut you can think of it that way but that's quite phenomenal and two-dimensional within the terms of what's happening within a system there is an implicit difference but the, it's actually the whole system and the underlying dynamics of the system that are changing itself um and the problem with origin is that for lucretius there's no real reason that why these these what's called the clonarmon or the clinamon happens these are completely spontaneous and 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 random so from sort of an anthropocentric point of view i mean this of course is getting back to my sort of bias with regards to nick land's work with in relation to anti oedipus in that i think it's actually quite quite an inhuman book in the way that we understand what a human is and in terms of an anthro anthropocentric or human centric point of view what happens happens here and this idea that there's no such thing of that no such thing as beginnings implicitly destabilizes what our our human understandings of identity because our identities aren't born in some sort of blank slate which we've picked and chosen and built ourselves they're already in the middle of a machine they're already in the belly of a machine which has been going on long before they're around and will go on a long time afterwards so the sort of the cogs which began this the the initial cog turns which began the machine whirring the choices and decisions and the agencies which began things have already begun but obviously to De Deleuze and Guattari <clears throat> make it clear that they're not some originary beginning but they would have had a beginning themselves so to find this idea of a beginning is sort of impossible so you're always in the middle of something and when we look at this in terms of the schizophrenic um, these ideas of a flow which is interrupted to when we think of a coherent flow that's going on within society or going on within an institution these are coded these are coherent coded flows and fluxes and um should we say functions or movements but they're they're coded they're complete they have um an inherent functionality which is allows them retain to retain themselves as a sort of coherence both temporally and both in terms of how we understand them the schizo and the, the schizophrenic process is breaking down these functions and begins these these cuts and interruptions it's schizophrenia which allows this to cut now i introduced lucretian atomism and i do want to make it clear that this is something that's always been unclear for me is that if there's a basis of lucretian atomism to deleuze and guattari then in what sense is the schizophrenic spontaneous and in what sense can schizophrenic activity actually be actually how can we under, understand that in terms of agency and i think this is where it's important to move it away from the clinical um, the clinical understanding of schizophrenia because that's of course tied in with what happens to the in quotation marks normal human when something sporadically inhuman sort of infects it and that's the clinical understanding and when we look at that abstractly what the process of schizophrenia um whether or not it's spontaneous i think is a is a big question and whether or not it can sort of be honed is a big question um that's one route that we can look at here one of one other thing that's really important here especially with the holes and parts section is that when Deleuze and Guattari are thinking about holes and parts is that when you have a hole that is made of a, 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 an assemblage of parts or a lo load of parts the unifying factor of it doesn't alter the parts into a unification whereby their singular realities as parts disappears and it just becomes one whole the in abstract in abstract what it is that unifies all of these parts is a part in itself so you have this unification but in theorizing that the part there is it's simply another part which allows for the unification of these parts Deleuze and Guattari understand are you know they're being extremely critical and almost skeptical of the possibility of a sort of universal form of unification and wholeness um and you know i've read here that you can sort of think of oedipus abstractly in this manner where the oedipal systems and the oedipal states can be thought of in this manner that there is all these parts within them and there is also something else which is cohering these together 
And I think Deleuze and Guattari are sort of making it important to realise that just because all these parts are interlocking, they, they haven't become this sort of le Leviathan-like structure, which we can't criticise, which has almost become like an a priori truth. They are stating and criticising both the parts, but also what's important is what actually allows something to be Oedipal is that part which coheres a whole. So what is it which somehow coheres all these things together and forms something that is considered Oedipal? Um, and so I think those are the two important roots here. But, you know, as I state, another thing that we can discuss if anyone, you know, we've, we've, Deleuze and you could spend, you could spend, honestly, you could spend your lifetime reading this book and getting into it. So anyone who's sort of still feeling a bit um, shaky about the actual and the virtual design machine or body without organs, then I think, you know, before we venture into the, the, the next chapters, which get a bit more specific. So the next one's, the next one is more about, is about psychoanalysis. You know, this would be a good opportunity to sort of say, well, hang on, you know, time of uh, a session of clarification, so to speak. But these are things that I would, I would sort of throw out to begin with. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone has got any questions? Let's uh, let's get into this. Yeah, um, on the bottom of the page sixty-two for the University of Minnesota PDF, um, on the top of the final paragraph, they bring up the word schizes. Um, what is that referring to? This is a vocabulary question. Schizes on every hand that are valuable in and of themselves. And later on, it says schizes have to do with heterogeneous chains. It's just more clarification what that means. Uh, yeah, I'm just getting to the page. So, did you say the top of 62? Uh, final paragraph of, well, I guess and the page number is 39, but sorry, there's two page numbers, 39 at the bottom and 62 at the top out of 423. Yeah, if we're going to my page number, final paragraph of 39, where it brings up schizes. I was looking at the wrong page number count. That's okay. One second. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the full paragraph there is, these chains are the locus of continual attachments, on, uh, schizes on every hand that are valuable in and of themselves, and above all must not be filled in. This is thus the second characteristic of the machine. Breaks that are a detachment, which must not be confused with breaks that are a slicing off. The latter have to do with continuous fluxes that are related to partial objects. Schizes have to do with heterogeneous chains, and as their basic unit, use detachable segments or mobile stocks resembling building blocks or flying bricks. It seems to me that um, the, the difference there is just between schizes and partial objects. Now, partial objects, Bill's here. So Bill, I'm very glad he's here because he knows he's, I know he's a big fan of partial objects, but it seems that in terms of when we were talking about these breaks and detach and breaks and interruptions and attachments, the, the skiz is something which is entirely detached, whereas the partial objects still have this um, determining factor on their predicate. So it's, they're still determinant and still, um, anchoring themselves in relation to that which they have um they're not they're, they're, they've de they've detached from but have not um sliced off from but bill is now here so bill in terms of partial objects how do you understand the skizzes um so like i think so uh i think the key word here if we want to look at this so i, I think chat this the section five is really key because if if like the last the, the last chapters of the three synthesis seemed a little bit confusing. I think they're being they're being very clear for the way they write, at least in this section. So I so if we want to understand what they mean by breaks and cuts, what we need to understand is the is, is how, how these break flows work, right? So essentially the interruption, right? The interruption is the so there are two types of flows essentially, right? There's an interruption flow, and there's also a, a there's a, a sort of breakdown that occurs at, at the same time, right? So a, a breakdown is understood as sort of like, I mean, I think I think the technical term actually relates to like sedimentary, the way rocks sort of hit sediment. But um, these sort of skizzes or cutting off is essentially the fact that a machine draws one part 
from the, another machine and it's constant it's constantly being drawn from another machine and which another machine is connected to it and each time it takes a flow and it transforms the flow but the thing is that you they they they, they see pretty clearly machines only work by breaking down so the key thing to understand here in this breakdown is essentially that what happens in a break is that there's essential disconnection but we also need to keep in mind there's nothing nihilistic about this disconnection right it's it's not like there's something lost here what's happening in this breakdown is essentially we have an open circuitry almost we have this ability for new flows to get interrupted right and that's why uh so later on they're going to talk about the code here the code is so important is because the, the code on the body without organs right the, that aspect of that so that those semiotics on the body without organs is what allows, you know, it 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 it, al- it tells it tells the desire machines where to cut the flow and where to break the flow, right? So it 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 basically guides those machines. I think I think I like Eugene Holland's example actually. He has a nice example of this in the sense that he talks about, um, maybe it's not a perfect example in this situation, but he talks about a bachelor, right? The way a bachelor gets 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 coded on when he's uh, when he's called when he's when he's so so a bachelor can. Can a bachelor can essentially has has more freedom than a married man, right? And that's because he's coded as a bachelor, so he can interrupt more flows than a married man can. I'm sorry, could you repeat the end of that bachelor statement there? I couldn't really hear the last couple words. Uh, yeah, sorry, wait, go, give me a minute. My dog started barking a bit. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, Scrub, he was just saying that um, the way in which a bachelor is coded, as opposed to the way in which a married man is coded, allows there to be more freedom for the the bachelor within the sort of the social body without organs, and in, in general within his body without organs. So the way in which these um, the the virtualities of these two separate um, body without organs are coded allows for uh, different realities of freedom. Gotcha. And I guess my next question would be is about more clarification on the difference between sliced off and detached codes. I'm not sure I really understood much the difference between those. I was waiting for Bill to get back. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that I would just say on that in terms of detachment, in terms of um, the specific section you were referencing with with regards to this, the, the skizzes is that um, the detached codes still that which is sliced off becomes an entirely separate um, virtuality unto itself, entirely separate from the thing that's been sliced off from. Whereas that which is detached is still is is <laughs> still has an attachment. So if you think of the rhizome, which is probably a really good way to think about it. Um, I'll try and find a diagram just, to, but if you think of an, uh, a point, just a, uh, just a point, you know, uh, let's say a black point and a line goes out from it. If something is to ta- and let's, and let's say in the middle of this line, there is an interruption, but it's a detached interruption. That line then fragments off, but it's still attached to that originary line. And then there is a new node that happens. So it's detached from that originary point, the original sort of flow that, that it was, um, in communication with but it's detached in the sense that it's become something new whereas it seems that sliced off in terms of the rhizome is that in terms of the rhizome things can be just completely born again somewhere completely different so you just have a completely sliced off um, n- new reality okay I see I gotcha but so can you hear me yeah yes um how could it be like born again, as you said, if at least what I'm gleaning off of what we've talked about so far today is that it seems like for Delius and Guitari, there isn't a concept of identity, like because you start in the middle of a process and you were saying that the parts don't contribute to like a unified whole in the sense where um, there's actually like an identity given to those parts. So how how could they be born again by just being sliced off? Would they not just be like become the middle of another process? If that makes sense, it's a complicated question. 
Um, yeah, no, it makes complete sense because it's sort of a paradoxical in um, in its nature is how that how the can how can something be born in relation to something where um, there is no connection to that previous relation, um, and I think this is where this is really where when I said there was this confusion for me with their basis from Lucretian atomism, which is just this idea that atomically something can spiral off and be completely spontaneous, is that even within the middle of a system, one can understand that there can be spontaneous breaks within an already preconceived system. And to use sort of um, maybe a, a historical metaphor, when we think of what's going on in terms of the art world in uh, the early 1900s, Dada, which was just this absolutely chaotic sort of moment of, of art, and it spanned only five years, crops up all over the world, all at once, but none of the, only a few of the people who are partaking in it are talking to each other. So if we abstract that out a bit, this sort of spontaneous break happens within reality which arises in this completely new and seems to have no real attachment to any of the pre previous forms, except maybe as an antagonism. Um, so it becomes its complete, completely its own thing, and it arises very spontaneously, almost like um, sort of a fit of genius or a brainwave. No one can really... There are things which arise which you can't really um, understand where they come from. So there's sort of two different conceptions of difference, and one is sort of the difference that arises from the break in a, an already preconceived system, so a difference from a system, which is this uh, idea of detachment. And then this idea of being sliced off um, is this idea of spon spontaneity, and something just arising as and like an atomic eruption, um, as like a almost like a rogue virtuality, which just appears. And in terms of sort of saying how and how these come about, I think in terms of human perception, it doesn't sort of, it doesn't come about in the way that we can sort of understand in a linear fashion. Does that make any sense? <clears throat> yeah, no, that, that helps clear it up a little bit. Um, so with the, so are these, I guess to like make things super clear, like they are actually wholly originary. They're not somehow derivative of the original machine. It's, it seems to, it does seem to be that way, but it's, I'm just very cautious of speaking about origins in relation to Deleuze and Guattari because what can be considered originary is sort of a difficult topic in terms of virtuality. Um, and once again, you know, I almost bring this in at every conversation I have of philosophy I have these days. One of the best sort of examples of this when we actually think about it in terms of time is that, as of Michel says, folded hand handkerchief. So you plot, once again, you plot time as a grid on a handkerchief um, and then fold it, fold the handkerchief up in different points in time as I read it, different virtualities, which sort of virtualities which are understood as that temporal framework of, of that certain time, whether it be a certain year or a certain date, these begin to meet. And from this, you can understand that in terms of originary, we're still thinking of something which has been drawn from the general body without organs, which is where all virtualities are held and is atemporal. So it's not in the time, it's not in our linear time. So in terms of origin, the, the entire idea of origin only really works on a linear time frame and Deleuze and Guattari aren't working within, they're working within a uh, post-critical or a critical theorizations of time, um, sort of in the same manner of Sarah's in which time simply isn't linear in that way. So the origin's just, the, the entire idea of an origin, especially in relation to a human, just doesn't really make sense because you already have this general body without organs where all potentiality and possibility for um, things to be born is held. So in terms of that they arrive or arise at some point in time, it's not like they're starting something. They are just in, in pure time and 
are sort of um, just encapsulate an event. It's not in any sort of linear fashion. Okay, so they're already inscribed, like always already inscribed on the body without organs, which, and then it just can pop up sort of at any of those those temporal moments, but that doesn't make it original because it was already there. The, pro the, the problem is in, in thinking about, in thinking about critical time, you arise into a lot, a lot of problems. So like, when you said there about something popping up or the, for the idea of something to pop up at either in the, it popped up in the past or it popped up in the future is once again this idea of linear time so it's like it popped up is it always going to be in relation to something um so in terms of in terms of the way in, to think of it, it's like a very human way of thinking about it and in terms of um the actual and the virtual the virtual is in, is in pure time it's not there isn't any real um the past and the present and the future just aren't things in pure transcendental time. So in terms of something cropping up, it's not so much that it appears in a linear fashion, like, oh, it's going to just pop up tomorrow. What that seems to be is that this intensity of temporality or is this, this intensity of virtuality appears, but it's not as if this is a, an intensity from the past, the present or the future. So when we think again of that folded handkerchief, the, the point that Sarah tries to make with this, which I sort of should have reiterated, so this is my fault, is that the example that he gives as well is that the thing that I spoke about earlier, Lucretian atomism, this appears again roughly in the form of cybernetics in what we understand as the 1960s. Lucretius is working in 44 AD, I believe, and then there's another theorization very, very close to this called nonlinear dynamics, which is very, very new. It's the 1990s. And within these three, what what we'd call chronic or linear times, so 44 AD, 60s, and then let's say the 90s, these are three entirely separate linear moments in time, but the, the same virtuality is appearing in them. So when these things appear, it's not like a very specific form of time is appearing, but this virtuality is entering into the other virtualities which are happening within that time. So when they enter in, something new is happening with them, and something sort of is being seen again but says making the point that really what we're looking at is is a sort of a form of virtual intensity so sort of the the virtuality itself re remains the same but it seems to be the way that it's viewed and the way it's altered is different um but yeah sorry someone want to say something uh bill you were going to say about virtuality and intensity I, I, I don't know. I, I, they're not the same thing, though. We need to be careful about that because I, I know some people who read, like James Williams, is reading of difference and repetition. That's quite a controversial one, I think, because he, he. Some people say that he convolute um, the virtuality as being close to the same thing, pretty much as the intensive, which causes, I think, a lot of problems with regards to which one. You know, which. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, it, it almost makes the virtual more real than the, than the actual or something. But I mean, I, I think I think that's another topic for another day i think one thing that we need to keep in mind though i think also what this 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 section is saying pretty explicitly is that what's the the body without organs is created right and that's one of the key things that will come along later when we discuss capital and stuff but the fact that uh, the body without organs is is produced at a specific time when desiring production first occurs and what we see is we see recordings and these recordings are sort of they're a signifying semiotics, right? That they that they are essentially almost. I mean, Gasser in his later work, he just he he goes on this like later what he did in the eighties. He he goes into this a lot further when he talks about diagrams, right? That essentially what we have here in terms of a a signifying chains is that these these work in a sort of diagram diagrammatic way to sort of tell they and it's a very material way, right? One of the things they're they're trying to do in this is a materialist psychiatry. They're trying to make these these flows of desire is something that's a very real thing happening on a very imminent level in our environment. So I think one thing we need to keep in mind is that what happens is there's, there's a process and they talk about this really well when they talk about um, essentially the signifying chain that essentially, so they say we, we owe it to Lacan for discovering this chain. But the key thing here is that essentially from these movements of desire and production, what we have is the recording 
of certain certain disjunctions that happen when at a certain stage. And these recordings, depending on, you know, whether you have a greater I gave the example of The Bachelor and stuff, but depending on whether you have you have it's depending on what you have recorded on there that you can choose from, you know, a greater degree of intensity. Right. That's why they say that the schizo is living at such an intensive state that they have such a they, they have this super intensive state because they they're almost they're one one thing is that they're outside all symbolic orders. But the other thing is that they're they, they have all these potentials almost they don't restrict themselves it's the same way i don't know we do on on our body with our roots for example in terms of what we have produced and inscribed on it <clears throat> the key thing is that those signifying chains are what sort of allow us to break a flow somewhere and break a flow another where and it's 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 almost you can almost look at it almost such a way that it could be restricting at the same time if you re, if you record something like oedipus on it right the oedipus oedipal triangle where it's where it becomes desire for this shift into one look off or it could give you a radical freedom in the sense that it open it, it it has all these disjunctions where it multiplies the the potentials. So the key thing we need to keep in mind is it's it's produced in a certain way, and it's it's their, their social conditions play a lot in to how this this uh, this metaphysical object is formed and allows you to have freedom. Um, so uh, later on, we're going to we're going to talk about uh, social production. Well, essentially, what, what happens is it, it, they 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 talk about well. It's one of one of the examples was the the prohibition of incest, right? The prohibition of or or global objects in terms of the way psychoanalytical treatment treats uh, treats the mother or the father. At least at least what we read later in this in chapter one, they, they end on that whole thing with Melanie Klein, where Mel Melanie Klein consumes a global object. As soon as you create a global object, you create one sort of transcendent signif or despotic signifier that essentially it forces desire to go in certain locations. So it, what, what's happening is it's the recording of these sort of despotic signifiers in terms of in traditional practices like psychoanalysis. Also, we can't really put the blame on psychoanalysis. Eventually, when we start talking about genealogy and the way the psychoanalytical practice develops, you know, they, they, they say that it was a very specific development. There's a very specific reason why the psychoanalytical clinic developed. And as soon as we start going into those things, we understand why, why, why essentially, you know, why essentially we have certain limits on our body without bodies without organs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What um, you uh, you weren't here at the start, Bill. So do you think that the, just in this final section before we head into chapter two, there is anything I you know I I mentioned that these are the sections which are covering desiring machines, the idea of machines, body without organs. Um, this section specifically is this idea of the whole and the parts which i touched on but do you think before we head into chapter two especially chapter three um there's anything that we should clarify from this first section uh i, th I think uh, the the key thing thing here in this first section is that what we have here are syllogisms right what we what we have here are they've explained so they've they've actually explained two things in my opinion they've explained what are the possible conditions for it for uh for experience but they've also explained what are the condition possible conditions for all real experience the reason for that is because they've explained the genesis of 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 the of, of the syntheses right they've explained how desire and production happens how, how the first synthesis happens but they've also and they've also explained the genesis of all three syntheses which is something that that Dula starts building up first in difference and repetition but by explaining the genesis of these three syntheses, what we have is this notion of they've split, they've found these real conditions for all real experience. And now, what what happens when we get to chapter two is we're going to see what psychoanalysis says as their transcendental conditions, and those are essentially paralogisms, right? So how it's it's very Kantian in the sense that they're going to ask, you know, what's what's the imminent principle and what's the transcendent principle. And whatever doesn't conform to this imminent law that we've built up so carefully in in this first chapter can be deemed as causing lack or causing us to desire own repression, for example. I have a question. Can you can you hear me though? I'm just using my um, computer's mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, what are these syllogisms? Like, what are the basic, like the premises, middle term? like that you're talking about here and where do they apply like what concepts do they apply because this would help clarify like structure 
where we're going and where we're starting from. Yeah. Okay. That's that's uh, that's that's pretty much the, the the like the big question of chapter one, to be honest. But I, and that's why I like section five, because section five, I think it gives it explains it a lot. So the first syllogism, right, is 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 the connective synthesis of production, which is desiring produ- that desiring production, right, where you have desire that couples flows to objects and then desire flows through these objects and you have these flows. Then the second, this, this, the second one is the, is the, is the, is the disjunctive synthesis of recording, which is, um, which, in, which is basically the production of, well, first you have the production of, of an anti-production in the process of desire and production, which leads to the production of recording on a body without organs. Right. And that production of recording, you know, it functions almost like memory. That's a good analogy, in my opinion. You you can think of it as, but it's not a perfect analogy because it's more it's 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 more so a, 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 what what's what's you know it's 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 much more than memory, right? It's a question of where do what what are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do, almost. Um, and from 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 the desire mission, from that we get to the, from from depending on what what we have recorded. Uh, there is a buildup of the the body without organs attracting ability and the body without organs repulsing ability, and that buildup leads to us leads to the production of intensities, right? And these intensities get recorded, get, get distributed along the body without organs. And these intensities, you know, there's a good image in a thousand plateaus of the dogon egg with a bunch of circles on it. But um, what these intensities are are essentially almost identities or religions or clans or something like that but then and what then what we get in the end is the production of subjectivity and so, so it's it's from these syntheses that they're trying to understand the true objective nature of desire almost how does desire flow how does desire you know how can we think of desiring flowing in an imminent condition where what we're going to understand later is we're going to look at all the paralogisms of psychoanalysis which is about you know the incorrect understanding of the way desire flows it's a, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but that's, that's the best I can do, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to listen to that again. <laughs> um, I think I wrote a little bit about, uh, if you scroll up a bit, I think I, I tried to write about this a bit on, on a long post, okay. I think, on the channel. So, yeah, before Bill, before we move into the psychoanalytical section, which is uh, comes up a lot in Chapter 2, do you do you want to give an overview of what Deleuze and Guattari see as the incorrect um, mode of psychoanalyzing and and of um, attending to the theory of desire? Uh, right now. Sorry. I uh, you want me to do it right now? Yeah, if you can, because you were just mentioning that that it's sort of it's it's gonna be it's going to become an important question. Yeah, I'll try and I'll try my best there. So uh, you have. An illegitimate use of the so what we have is what they go they gradually call it five paralogisms right and they 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 give five paralogisms and three of them are illegitimate use uh, uses of these uh, connective syntheses these these certain syntheses but then later on they go outside this uh, this transcendental this incorrect transcendental field and they start exploring you know social conditions too. But I'll start with the, the first one's essentially a legitimate use of the connective synthesis. And what they say is that rather than looking at these, you know, disjointed organs, rather than, rather than looking at, because, you know, this is what he builds in the logic of sense, where he says that the, that the organs are in the state of death, that, that, sorry, death, but uh, the organs are essentially that they exist before global persons, right? Before, before the mother, before the father. And it's you know, like the mother's breast is not, it's not the mother's breast, it's just a breast. So what psychoanalysis does is it doesn't study these partial objects. It studies the mother's breast. It studies the father's breast. It, it assigns a global and a specific value rather than a local and non-specific value. And what it, what it is, it's like, it's, it's, it's essentially an extra, what they call an extrapolation. And then they, then they create, what happens is you get a transcendent signifier, like the phallus, for example. What ha- and, it, it, and essentially this is what creates lack, right? When you when you when you create these, they go into a, a lot more detail. So I'm trying to be as succinct as possible. But essentially, it's these global objects that create lack. Then we get the illegitimate use of the disjunctive synthesis, and they cite a couple of people here. They cite you know they cite Gregory Bateson, uh, who had an he had an interesting, interesting theory of schizophrenia with regards to the double bind, which was actually a response to Russell. But uh, 
what the what the legitimate use of the disjunctive synthesis it's an exclusive and restrictive use rather than an inclusive and non-restrictive use so essentially you have what what happens is you, it's it's essentially the recording of a despotic signifier on the code of the body with that organs and it's, it's it's almost like the it's 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 the it's 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 the it's the cure that's the double bind not the disease right it's it's a, essentially the recording of oedipus so it's like you either you either resign yourself to the fate, fate of castration and you embrace the, you you basically are condemned to re- repeat this or you go you go into you become alienated so you have like two undesirable options right it's it's either you come to terms with your lingering anxieties or you you give away to this Oedipal desire, and you you fall into this almost this realm of the undifferentiated, as they say. Um, now, then, there's also the illegitimate use of the conjunctive synthesis, and that's essentially as they describe it: it's sort of segregative and a biunivocalization. vocalization. A biunivocalization vocalization is to take two things and to understand it as the same. They also talk about this a lot in the rhizome chapter, right? They say that these these molarities take all these multiplicities and they turn them into a they biunivocalize vocalize them when they describe rhizomes. But and essentially, when they do it, when they do that, they 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 basically negate a nomadic and polyvocal use, right? So you know, it's it's the it's, it's well, it, well, this is they're going to essentially talking talk about the family, right? And the family is never a microcosm, and you know, children are surely not aware that that the, the father has a, has a boss who's the father's father, and more that the father himself is a boss who is not a father, right? It's it almost seems ridiculous. I, I think the key thing with all these paralogisms that they start discovering is that they realize. It, I think it's very relevant for today also when people think, oh, psychoanalysis is just some nonsense, right? They actually have a line when they say, you know, it's much scarier if people think Oedipus is complete nonsense because you know then people are really getting Oedipalized and they have no idea that they're getting Oedipalized at the same time. And it's actually more dangerous in that way. Then the fourth paralogism, which is probably the most, the most, uh, the most important for them is the prohibition of incest, right? So it's because of, it's because of social repression and psychic repression that we have, a that we essentially have a, 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 a like a, we have a weak subject and essentially it's from that prohibition of incest by places desire in a, in a, in a distorted representation and you know desire gets essentially told so we just say so incest was prohibited and, and desire is told oh so that's what i wanted i actually wanted desire for the mother because desire becomes so manipulatable under these familiar uh, un, under the conditions of the nuclear family according to that and but then the fifth paralogism is essentially that people don't understand that the oedipus complex is something that exists in a virtuality on the body without organs rather than something that that existed from the beginning, right? So, like Freud with Freud's explanation for the prohibition of incest would be something along the lines like, "Oh, it was bound to happen because Oedipus is a universal structure everyone goes through," rather than thinking of it inversely in the sense that, "Oh, maybe it was the prohibition of incest that actually caused the Oedipus complex." I, I, I don't know if that was very helpful, but I tried to. That's basically the entire chapter two to a certain degree. Yeah, no, no, no. It's really, uh, really articulate as, uh, as always, Bill. Um, I'm just trying to think of what to cover before we we head in. Does anyone else have any uh, any questions or things they'd like to sort of cover? Yeah, I have another vocabulary question um, for the University of Minnesota uh, version near the bottom of page 41, when they talk about the three modes of desiring machines. They mentioned disjunctive and the conjunctive synthesis called Newman and Voluptus. Is there any special meaning in those two names? Is there anything we need to know? Or are, is it not that important? That we just know disjunctive synthesis is called Newman and conjunctive synthesis is called Voluptus. So I, I think if I remember correctly, uh, Newman, I think that I don't know if it's if they're explicitly referring to Kant, right? But Kant had the famous distinction phenomena. And Newman it was one of his ways of saving the Catholic conception of God and keeping the Catholic conception of God within the sort of Enlightenment tradition. But you know, God became something that you you can't know God's existence, but you can think God in a certain way. Um, but the, but then that yeah, I, I think that's why they're associating the Newman with something mystical. Right, and it, it has to be mystical in a sense that they say it's miraculating. Right, it seems that all production actually comes from the body without organs, rather than the fact that the body without organs was produced in the first stage. 
And I think that's why they choose a word like numino. I think I think in the sense that it refers to something mystical. Uh, I'm not so super sure about voluptuousness. Okay. I know somebody asked actually earlier, I forgot who it was, but somebody was asking about the celibate machine. Why is it called a celibate machine? And I was actually, so they, when they described the celibate machine, they were, they were, they uh, referred to one of the pieces by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, I think it's called the bride's strip bear by her bachelor's even. But so Duchamp, Duchamp, when he created that piece, he actually had like, he took, I think he took 20 years to make that piece, but he has hundreds of notes on it. And I was actually going through the notes recently. And I think if you go through some of the notes, he actually refers to a celibate machine. So I think the term actually directly comes from Duchamp, but that's just that term. Yeah, I just want to state in relation to the syntheses as well. It does seem to me that, and I, this is sort of the same for Deleuze's three syntheses, so that um, the same goes for Antiedipus, that the, they're mirroring the threefold synthesis from the Critique of Pure Reason, which is of, um, blimey, uh, imagination... Hang on, I'll have to get my notes. But it, it just, it's it always seems extremely clear to me that that is what they were tackling, and yet this rarely, rarely comes up. So, in when you were in saying in relation to what these the, the semantic problem with relations to the Newman, um, you know, it seems certain that that would be in relation to the Newman. But it's interesting what you're saying about Duchamp. Um, I didn't actually know that about him, but that final work did take him like twenty twenty years to make. Um, certainly an interesting work as well. Yeah, no, it's very interesting because, I mean, so Deleuze with his use of citations is very strange because I, I don't think he ever cites Duchamp's, Duchamp calling it a cell machine in this book, but his use of citations, like sometimes he'll tell you everything, right? Sometimes he'll refer to someone like Raman Rouillet in this book, like, who was a really interesting like uh, philosopher of science who was a big influence, not a lot of people. He had a really influenced book on the genesis of lived forms, which is really interesting but then other times he, he won't reference like indifference and repetition there's like a paragraph that's like i think i'm pretty sure it's like it's straight up ripped out of ernst cassier but he won't reference it so it's very interesting but other times other times he's really generous like he's i don't know i think the one place where he cites even francois lateral elf yeah i mean deleuze seems to have stolen from all over the place but in terms of it being understood as being stolen it seems that there was so much going on at the same time and these books taking years and years to write that there's a point where like if you read a lot of the literature that was also being written around the same time even some of Serre's stuff some of Leotard's stuff they're all clearly in the same with having the same dialogue and meeting at the same places etc so I think there's a lot of there's so much overlap that you begin to see repetitions um, within a lot of the works that are happening at the time. But yeah, um, are any is there any newcomers here who are sort of really stuck on something that they would like clarification on? Okay, I have no a little Go ahead. I have a vocabulary question as well about um distinctions between um actual virtual and the real so the real i, th I think i collect is produced through anti-production some sort of like art form but so how does that differ from the actual and i get like the virtual was a deterritorialization but i'm just wondering if you could clarify those three terms So, in terms of the virtual and the actual, as has been said by Bill, so he might have to come in after this. My reading of the virtual is fairly, uh, I think it, at times it could be um, radical, so I'll try to keep it fairly simple. But in terms of um, when we think of um, a desk and we think of the actuality of a desk, I understand it as we are, we are dealing with the, with the actuality, we're dealing with the phenomenal reality of the desk it's hard it's um clunky it's a, a cuboid um these attributes are very singular to its actuality so actuality is a singular singular to the object whereas the virtualities are the possibilities of its reality which are sort of 
easiest to think of as being behind it. Um, so the virtualities are its hardness or its clunkiness. So these are things which can um, be transferable and, and um, sort of almost networked possibilities between items and it allows us to actually um, in a certain sense in a in a representational way make connections between the possibilities and potentialities of um, objects and things which are happening now in terms of this was pointed out in one of the in the first se session we had of this in terms of virtuality I always think it's really it, it's really helpful to think of it in, in the virtuality is in two ways one is sort of a communication and two as as possibility and potentiality so in terms of a desk within the virtuality of a desk there are there is that the, the collection of the virtualities within a desk would be that desk's body without organs it's the virtualities which make it up to be that object in a virtual sense but within that and as well resides all its possibility and potentiality so one of the examples that was given in the first lecture is that within the virtuality of a tree is the possibility of becoming a desk because that is a potentiality for it um in terms of the real is sort of a matter of possibility in terms of the the the, the virtual conditions what is possible within the real so in terms of what's happening this is why the schizophrenic is, is important because the schizophrenic pushes the limits of the virtual to allow for new possibilities the the easiest way to think about it is the virtuality is the thing which conditions what can be possible and what can be real and then there's intensity which i think bill sort of has a firmer grasp of that than me so i don't know if bill has any comments because he's clearly i think he even know, he knows anti was extremely well so i don't know I, I would disagree with that but uh i i think uh so actually i don't want to touch this subject to be honest because it's a very i think it's a very it's a very controversial uh, subject i think in Deleuze and gatari scholarship because um really the, the the distinctions between at least the virtual that was given in difference and repetition anti i think like the virtual is only mentioned like once i think in anti oedipus and it and then, and then when it's mentioned actually a lot in a thousand plateaus it, it, it's a sort of tricky subject because you know some people like ian buchanan think that oh they're talking about the same thing except that they're just using it in, different, in slightly different ways um and, but then on the other side, you find people that will be like, "No, it's a completely different virtuality this time." So it's, it's a very hard discussion to make, actually. But I, I think, uh, at least what I'll, what I'll say is that it's they, they are similar to a certain degree. But I, I, I can't say 100% that I'm going to read the virtual in the same thing as they say in a thousand plateaus in the same way that they describe the body without organs here. I think with regards to intensity, though, I think it's a little bit easier because I think they define intensities here a little bit clearly than they actually define in difference and repetition. I think so the pattern that I think some people tend to forget in difference and repetition, it goes, so it goes, it, 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 it first, you first have a virtual field and from the virtual field, you get an intensive, right? You can't say that the virtual and the intensive are the same thing. They also say it about say something similar here, right? It's not like it's not like what's recorded is the same thing as intensity. The body without organs goes through a certain process, and intensities are created from the from the relationship between attraction and repulsion, and that's when we get intensities. So, it's it, 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 there is there's a even though maybe it's not linear, but there is a sequential process that takes place, and we need to be very cognizant of that, right? Because it's a sequential process of production, even though it's always production, as they say. Um, what what we need to understand is that essentially, what's well, what, if these things are being produced at a certain stage. So this this and another thing. I mean, a lot of people were asking about vocabulary, but I think with the lesson gets very, it's it's very hard to ask a question about vocabulary because what you know their voc vocabulary they they have written this in such a way that their vo vocabulary signifies nothing. What it, but it does something, right? <laughs> you can't understand even like you know who's talking. Is it the mad? Is it is it the mad person or the, do the doctor? You can only understand by looking at what the person is saying they're doing rather than what their identity is given to them. But so if we go a little bit closer to this aspect of intensity, what how they describe intensities is that it's after the stage of recording. Um, there's a relationship between the fact that the body without organs uh, simultaneously repulses at the same time that it attracts. And there is a sort of relationship between the two. 
we need to understand that the relationship is not that it's not one of conflict in the sense that a Hegelian would say that it's it's essentially uh, two forces in contradiction with each other. That's what so there's the reason why they talk about number here, right? Because it's not about contradiction, rather it's about degrees. It's about, it's, it's about degrees going up. So the full body with that organs is the zero zero intensity, but it's usually you go gradual up in, in degrees. And what these intensities are in the sense that they, they are they are affects or affects in the sense that they give they give someone an an, um, an identity in the sense that it's they, they, they would rather I don't know they would they, 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 there's almost like you know, again, this starts getting very controversial in some regards, but, you know, there's something like a transracialism also in Deleuze and Gatsari to a certain degree. And with, with the sense that, you know, people need to identify the things based on their affectivity, right? It's the sense that I, I think Judge Schreiber identifies with, the, with, with him becoming a woman in the sense that he feels the affectivity of being a woman. And in that sense, he's a woman. So the sense is that they're trying to go to this almost, this stage of, of, uh, uh, brute, I mean, aff affectivity at the end of the day is just an intense feeling for them. And that's why they call it intensity. But essentially what these intensities are is are the production of, uh, they're the production of identities, right? And these, but the key thing is here, what's so systematic, I think the key takeaway with this whole stage is that they've looked at things in these sort of, in the different level, they've, they've gone to, as, as Simon Don would say, they've gone to the pre-individual level. And by going to the pre-individual level, we've marked out such a stage of genesis that essentially we're able to, look at things imminently rather than transcendently. And we're essentially able to look at things in a more creative way as well, that essentially we, we understand before forms of social repression occur, how the, the potential diversities, right? That's why the schizo is, 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 not, is outside all symbolic orders because he essentially lives his life like this, for example, where he's, he's, he's open to all these diverse potentials and possibilities. So, uh, Bill, when you you said there that um, the vocabulary itself doesn't signify anything, but it does something, um, how how do you mean that? Because you just went on to right after to sort of explain intensity, talk about it resulting in identities, and um, you were talking about the difference between like transcendental and imminent, but if they don't signify anything and they're like, what do you mean by they're doing something and not signifying anything? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole discussion. I think that was going on in France at that time where the Simon Don wrote a whole book about going from, op, from structures to operations and all these, these pro and, and, and a lot of it's also there in like contemporary cybernetics as well. Like Norbert Wiener and stuff. But the thing is that you think of, <laughs> Oh, it's a little bit hard to explain because a lot of the machinations of this was first built up in difference in repetition. But the the way to understand, I would understand it, is in the sense that um, I, I like the analogy of looking at a painting, for example. Um, so a silly way to do art criticism when you look at a painting is to go and to go to the painting and be like, all right, so this is this much percentage of red, this is this much percentage of green, and. You, you basically judge everything based on, you know, these percentages, almost like some sort of scientific reductionism where you go and you look at the color and you're just judging the color with, oh, this is this this color is supposed to mean that. This color is supposed to mean that in the sense that this color is symbolizing red as in red for some sort of reference to something, or almost like Easter eggs in a video game. They're really, I mean, the, these kind of things, they don't actually do anything. What makes art, I, I think, a little bit more, significant is that essentially the art the artistic object does something for the indiv for the individual viewer right it's not that the art, art art object is is trying to symbolize anything it's the fact that the art object makes you makes you feel in a certain way and it's from that feeling that they're asking the question of what the art object does rather than what the art object signifies or means i hope that helps a little bit yeah i, th I think that helps that that sounds like it's um like your art example, though, just seems like it is a quite contemporary look on art. Like you said, it would be silly to look at it that way. Um, but like in classical art, like objects or colors or themes or even the affects that you get from the art were supposed to signify something else. So I was just a little confused, but I, I can kind of see how your example in like a contemporary context does apply to what's going on here is how are these like would it would it be correct to say something like the 
words, um, though they don't signify, say, some like outside definition, they function within the machine somehow to keep its flow going, like the machine of language, if we're being good to, to lose. Um, wait, sorry, I'm going to ask for a clarification, though. Uh, are you talking, I'm sorry, what do you mean by, by language, though? I mean, in terms of, uh, I don't know, just, make, just trying to make you a question of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The words that I, I'm speaking right now, because they don't actually carry a signification outside of them, um, and like the vocabulary I'm using, instead, say for example, they function within the machine to get you to hear me or something like that. Um, is that like a better way of looking at language? Is it doesn't have a meaning; it has a function. Same with uh, yeah. Same with yeah, I think I would agree. I guess I would agree with that to a certain degree. I mean, the key thing here is that essentially what they're looking at is is psychoanalysis and its hermeneutic style of analysis, right? The fact that they would do so a child, let's say a child is playing. Would they give this example of Melanie Klein, right? So a child is playing with their with 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 like a train set. <laughs> now the psychoanalyst will be like. All right, he'll ask the question. Now, what do you think this symbolizes? Oh, yes, this symbolizes that, that the child is playing with the, with the penis going into mommy, right? That's 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 what the psychoanalyst would think, and they would create this whole transcendent structure where they'll sit, they'll ask the question where meaning becomes this question of you know how do we connect it to this transcendent structure? What the child signifies? But what the and Gatari are saying is that the child is no, he's taking something else. He has a flow of desire. He's taking that flow of desire in a certain way and making it function in a certain in a certain assemblage of the toy set, for example. Is that, that open? Like, yeah, that's a really good example, actually. Um, because the if I'm if I'm following what you're saying is the like classic psychoanalyst is giving a signification. I'm um, saying that like you playing with this toy in this way signifies something as you're saying like transcendent outside of this imminent um, structure in front of me. Whereas Delius and Guattari are saying that the kid is trying, it isn't signifying anything. He's working with the machine to interrupt or um, improve its flows of some in some way. Like he's. Yeah. he's yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's how they say desire functions. And what, what happens with these flows is he starts producing, right? He produces an environment. It's a complex environment that he starts producing around himself. And, you know, th that's their imminent law. That's why they say it's materialist in the sense that these flows are real things that it's moving. It's not that these flows are interpreted. It's not like they've interpreted these, like in, in terms of they've not hermeneutically signified these flows. It's the sense that you've, they've, it's, it's a very, it's a material thing. It's, it's real. I think one one way to look at it as well um, is to think back to sort of to understand what is one of sort of the cornerstones of continental philosophy, which is to criticize and question the conditions of the experience um, and not the experience itself, um, which is precisely what Kant does. So like if we, I understand we're talking about Deleuze and Guattari, but I'll use Kant as the example first and then how explain how I understand that in terms of Deleuze and Guattari. It's like with Kant's critique, he's saying that what Descartes and what Hume were doing is is criticizing the actual experience we have of reality and existence, but not criticizing and theorizing of the conditions for that experience, which he understood would be the, the first thing. So when Descartes says, I think, therefore I am, he understands that as sort of like a closed loop proof that the am or thinking or am, which is being, is proof of the system itself. Whereas Kant would then follow on that argument and say, well, I think therefore I am, well, what the hell is am, what the hell is being? Um, so we need to begin there. We need to take this another other step back as, and then Kant obviously keeps going with this as far as you can and works out his whole system from the very conditions of experience. And in relation to Deleuze and Guattari, it's sort of saying, well, um, Oedipus, this psychoanalytical Oedipal structure is understood as this a priori transcendent thing, which is already there. Deleuze and Guattari seem to be saying, let's step back, hang on, what are the conditions which allow you to say, like, let's take your toy set example of the train going into the, the, the tunnel, you know, it's the, the phallus fucking mummy. What are the conditions 
which actually allow you to say that and in what sense are they they legitimized and vindicated and when you begin to look of that look at that their realization is that it's sort of a self-referential feedback loop like you're saying bill is that from this one initial point that you just accept that, that what they're stating is um sort of a transcendental truth you can then begin to prove the rest of the system but of course they sort of move back and actually look at the conditions and state well in terms of the sort of um, the language that psychoanalysis is using, that doesn't seem to be concurrent with the experience we're having. However, the conditions of that experience, there is such a thing as desire. There is such a thing as production and the production of desire. And there is such a thing as someone um, finding a means to um, articulate the desire within the world. However, the experience that then, then that psychoanalysts are then projecting it onto that's false. So Deleuze and Guattari, in a certain sense, I don't, I'm not sure if you'd agree, Bill, are moving back and looking at the conditions and then going forward again. Um, but the, but at the same time, they, they still I think they still see elements of, of psychoanalysis. They see these as useful ways of understanding how we, we tend to sort of repress and tie ourselves up and not just go back to the conditions of our desire. It's like as soon as you have a desire, it instantly gets fed through this language system of psychoanalysis. And, you know, like you said, Bill, that the really scary thing is, is their point is, well, what, what if this isn't even there? People are then being Oedipalized because instantly within their, their life, um, and especially within Lacanian psychoanalysis, where you have long infant studies, someone is sort of already born into the psychoanalytical system, which is Oedipal itself. So you're instantly filtered through. Whereas there is a step back and it's like, well, there are conditions because there's a condition of desire. But desire is is instantaneously getting repressed by the system which says it's it's out to seek to help it. And I think because, I mean, this is just, just sort of my own personal digression, but, but because this is such a preeminent force in people's lives, in many people's lives, this idea of psychoanalysis or the idea of therapy, the conclusions to this, because you've always had it, um, and or you've always had Oedipalized institutions, the conclusions to therapy and the conclusions to psychoanalysis seem to work. But it seems to Deleuze and Guattari that the questioning of them is, is that because they are fundamental truths? Or is that because they're simply, you simply have a reliance on the system that you were born into? Yeah, yeah. And I think no, it's a good time to raise this question. Um, do you think the version of psychoanalysis, which they, like their take on what psychoanalysis is, the way they approach it, is a fair presentation of psychoanalysis? Or do you think it's kind of straw man-ish? Um, I could try and answer that. So, uh, now, it's, uh, if you go to like Zizek or Baidu, they have some, there are some interesting critiques of this book, in my opinion, which I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of, because they, uh, I don't, as Dan Smith has a great essay on Zizek, where he basically, there's a, it's fueled with a lot of rage against Zizek. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if you look at academic rage, it's kind of funny. But, um, so, my, so this is my theory. I don't think Deleuze, I don't know, I don't think Deleuze and Guattari have ever written a critique. Like, it's just so orthogonal to their project to write a critique. What their project is, is at the very base limit, as they say in what is philosophy, is the creation of concepts. And it's the sense of these concepts. And, you know, it's not, a, it's not pragmatist. It's, 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 pragmat, it's, it's pragmatist in the sense that it's not teleological, right? It's not, they don't have some end goal in mind. But it's just for that pure bliss of creating concepts in the sense that essentially, um, essentially what, these, what these concepts are is that, you know, uh, um, the, the, the whole point is, is, is not to think about what's wrong with the system. The whole point is saying, all right, let's, how can we do something more interesting, right? And how can we, and, and essentially the whole idea is by creating something more interesting, they all, it's like the affirmative force in Nietzsche and Deleuze is reading Nietzsche, is by creating something more interesting, you automatically just, the, the reactive force just gets destroyed on its own because you're just creating something so interesting. But with regards to the whole reading of Lacan and stuff, it's, it, it, it's I, don't, I don't see it as like, like it take you know sure they have some humorous lines like they say oh Lacan couldn't handle he would go sacre bleu at any time someone said sixty minutes session or something but or Melanie Klein hitting the kids but the sense is that essentially what's what's what they're trying to do is they're trying to see okay so 
they don't, you know, you know, like I think if you go to like anyone on the street, you'll say, oh, Oedipus Complex. They'll just laugh at you. They're like, ha, you're talking bullshit. But, you know, they accept the Oedipus Complex full on. They say Oedipus is real. And, you know, that's the biggest problem. The fact that it's real is the problem. And what a bigger problem is that people don't think it's real today. It's, it's a scary idea. Um, but they also say stuff like, you know, in this chapter, as we see that, you know, the objet, like Lacan's objet petit art, when Gattari wrote that essay, Machine and Structure, uh, uh, Gattari describes the objet mach- petit art as an objet machina, right? He says, before we introduce the big other, the objet, pe- the, the objet machina is, and, or, or objet petit art is the same thing as a desiring machine. And there are all these concepts like libido energy that comes, they're using it in the same way Freud has it, but they're trying to make it more, they're trying to make it more inclusive. I, so I highly doubt that their reading of psychoanalysis is 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 is, uh, is, is bad by any means or a straw man. I highly disagree with that because I think what they're trying to do is they they like they barely care about psychoanalysis in my opinion. At the end of the day, what they are cared about is trying to say how can we make this better. So their whole goal is to think about okay, so how do we introduce the social field into psychoanalysis? How is how do as Gatari says how do we make sure the psychoanalyst is not hiding behind his office and how does he how is he interacting with the outside world? How, how is he bringing in all these? So, you know, how is it? And it's, it's a revolutionary practice in the sense that how is it not that how, how does the psychoanalyst protect like the capitalist institution, for example? And it's, it's all these questions about how can we make things better at the end of the day? And really, it's, it's, the, the whole thing about critiquing psychoanalysis is just saying they're trying to take elements and trying to make it better. Like it's just like we saw in this chapter, they took Lacan's notion of signifying chains, but they took it better. Right. Even Gatari in his later work, he starts adding like, you know, he creates a asemiotic chains these are chains like you know he created like chains for like biology like the flow of hormones and stuff and he so what they're trying to do is like the guts where he starts working more with the physics of the unconscious adding like quantum mechanics to it what they're trying to do is essentially they're trying to see how can we expand it so this is good they say this part of psychoanalysis is good and how can we take it further how can we make this you know even better how can we think about this on a much deeper level I've I've read some psychoanalysts in my day, and it is a little bit of a straw man, but they do um, also provide like a pretty like full critique. Um, however, though, um, where where they like val like where they valorize the schizophrenic, it's a little bit strange because um, like Del- I've been reading up on Deleuze too, and he was married with kids, like he was entirely subsumed under like an Oedipal complex you could say so I don't, there seems to be a, a sort of like disjunction or like like what are they, they actually like trying to tell you like what are they preaching versus like what are they doing so there's a seems to be like and, and I know the the like responses they're not valorizing like that kind of schizophrenic it's this different kind of schizophrenic that exists under capitalism but i still don't see how they resolve it but maybe we will but i mean so you're are you asking the question is do they pack practice what they preach it's because it's funny because you know Gatsuri when he did a solo practice at Laborde and stuff with Gene Aurey, what he would do is he would like he did a bunch of stuff to prevent like a lot of his patients to getting into Oedipus complex. And the whole point of schizoanalysis is to, at the end of the day that it's pragmatic and it's meant to be used for a certain degree, right? I mean that's that, that's the whole thing in at at least in in Laborde when they analyze like group fantasy and stuff. So I mean I'm I'm, I'm, I'm a bit lost. I mean are you saying that? Schizoanalysts cannot be like. Are you saying that schizoanalysis has, is is never applied or something? I'm um, exactly because they're taking on the um, status of therapists themselves. Which how does that differ from the psychoanalyst? Well, it's it, they don't. I mean, in Gatsby's solo practice, at least he it's a very different. I mean, he had this whole table at Laborde Clinic where he would he would try he would create this he would he worked he, he he his a lot of like his whole thing was to remove the therapist hierarchy right so one of the things he actually did was both the analyst and the analysand would get paid at the end of the day and i think that actually happened a couple times in laborde when they essentially you know when when he writes like chaosmosis the whole thing about chaosmosis what he describes like 
how the practice works on the board in the sense that it's, it's the, the idea of these dis- different productions or different subjectivity, right? He, he gives evidence of, you know, how subjectivity is almost produced in the same way that the artist paints on a palette. And the whole goal of, the whole goal of at least what happened later with, the, at least he changed the name to metamodeling in the 80s when he wrote like schizoanalytic cartographies. The whole thing was the point about was how do we analyze subjectivity in, you know, capitalist institutions and stuff and how can we think about changing it? So, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's easy to, to talk about like, oh, Deleuze was, it was an Oedipal framework. Like even, even Gazari was, you know, he, I think he had like a polyamorous relationship to try and escape Oedipal frameworks. I don't know how well that worked out at the end of the day, but it's, 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 uh, I, I wouldn't dismiss it right now, at least in the sense that it's, uh, it, it's essentially a strong, it's, cause, you know, I, I don't, I think the whole project is to try and think of something better. Just to add in a like an anecdote with regards to Guattari's polyamorous relationship, I'm not sure uh, it was entirely known to all the women that that was actually what was going on because apparently uh, when it came to his funeral, there was loads and loads of women who all believed that they were sort of his only lover and they were all extremely surprised to see the other women there. Um, so apparently his funeral was just a very, very awkward event. Um yeah, just thought I'd throw that funny anecdote in there. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Whereas Deleuze was like the complete opposite. Um, they're two sort of very different individuals. And for me, this idea of... Um, this goes back, I think, to one of the important things which is sort of overlooked in Antidipus because it is such a radical book. The idea of retaining your territory and the idea of having always retaining some territory and I don't think that always has to be understood in terms of, the, terms of the schizophrenia and it is actually sort of stated usually quite covertly but a few times that these structures and these um, institutions to a certain degree are seen as Deleuze and Guattari not necessarily as beneficial but as potentially beneficial um, and I think that any sort of radical binary reading where it's either seen as just a complete criticism or a strange promotion would be incorrect in the sense that I don't think it's really yeah I don't think it's a criticism in the in the any traditional sense I think it's almost like a mutation of psychoanalysis yeah I mean to be fair they haven't they haven't started critiquing psychoanalysts yet i mean they haven't they haven't they only started going deep into it in the middle of chapter two so i think we just need to wait if they want more answers on that so... good point um we've got about 30 minutes left um so if anyone's got any questions on this this first chapter um or any of the preface or the introduction um then uh, yeah feel free to sort of enter in uh, I just want to ask a question about the role of art in all this. I think it's on page 31. It's the first time they sort of mention art as playing any kind of role. I think they mention something about how it's able to introduce, it's able to short circuit social production by introducing an element of dysfunction, I think they say. And I'm curious what they mean by that. Do they say that art can essentially act as a revolutionary force within this system? Can it, can it uh, specifically mention like Salvador Dali, I think, like somehow introducing some by sort of playing and uh, they can break this idea of um, uh, desiring production? One thing that I'd comment there, especially in relation to you mentioning Dali, is that there is um, very, very clear connections in terms of philosophical lineage between Dali, Lacan, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, and the Surrealist movement um, in general. Um, And so Lacan... uh, Yes, Lacan wrote very early on for a couple, a couple of pieces in Surrealist um, magazines, and they were extremely inspired by his work. Um, I believe Andre, Andre Breton. Um, I might have got that mixed up, but there is very clear connections there. However, the Surrealist movement gets sort of misinterpreted, um, and ironically, it's sort of thanks to Dali, who, if you speak to some um relatively radical thinkers on this topic 
they would actually say that Dali, in terms of theorization, is not a surrealist. Now, that seems crazy because Dali is sort of the quintessential surrealist. However, there's sort of this problem in the idea that surrealism, in its theorization and, and in abstract, is what Dali aesthetically imagined it to be. Surrealism, if you think of what that word is, uh, is, is this extra addition to reality. It's not like a complete, ob you know, it's not altering reality to the point where it's like the weird Dali stuff. It's this extra addition which alters reality and, and reveals, in, and it does so in such a way that it reveals what we then consider to be surreal. And in terms of what you're saying, in, in terms of um, something which can doesn't sort of get subsumed into forms of social production. One of the things that springs to mind for me that a lot of the surrealists were doing with painting and with writing, which was, was called um, lucid painting and lucid, lucid writing. So this was sort of an attempt, especially with lucid writing, was, was simply to write whatever came to mind. And their theorizations of this from memory were doing so in relation to Lacan and Freud in terms of not allowing themselves to be constrained by any form of what we would consider uh, Oedipalization. So they were simply allowing the sort of the forces of production themselves to just take over. So in this manner, the, the surrealist form of art, when understood in that way, is just this complete expulsion of, a, of sort of potentiality and allowance, which is, which is at all times via just sort of almost putting its guard down in a sense, allowing the, the pure force of production to just overtake it and not allowing itself to be consumed by um you know uh, some form of some some objective goal which you would find in realist painting and this this happens a lot in in some of dali's more interesting work um you know people joke about the lobster on the telephone but in terms of what's going on there is this just complete overthrow of um any sort of realist procedure um and just giant geo puts in the puts in the chat that De surrealist and dada or uh, automatism influenced a lot of deleuze's um early art a philosophy on art um so that in terms of um in terms of how it doesn't get subsumed into social production is that this idea of of i just read it, it says allowing the forces to do what they they want to do as opposed to saying you know i'm a, a structuralist for instance so i'm going to do a structuralist painting Yeah, I know. It's, it's it's. I think with relation to art, I think uh, later on when they go go to um, when they go go to when they start talking at an introduction to schizoanalysis, they say schizoanalysis can be used with regards to art and science, and how art and science can come into the role of the production of subjectivity with regards to the way it it, it moves flows right because there's no difference at least for the unconscious between subject and object, as we understood a bit earlier, and essentially these flows get essentially moved by by these, uh, you know, these things that these objects that do things like the the art piece that does something, for example, and I, I think it gets a lot more interesting when Gatsby really writes Chaos Motions because that whole book's about its analysis of how uh, art is or even aesthetics in the most general sense is related to the production of subjectivity. And he says basically, like the art object can essentially it creates subjectivities, like 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 a, a machine assembly line. It's 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 a pretty it's a really wild book, but you know it's it's an analysis. Have any of you guys read uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, for example? Like he he analyzes Mikhail Bak Mikhail Bakhtin was a Russian literary theorist, and he analyzes Bakhtin's use of chrono chronotopes, which is essentially about how you know how how the language of art and stuff essentially comes together to interrupt these machinic flows. Does that sort of um, clear up your question in relation to art? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, though, sort of comes another question. So um, it seemed like you and Bill both gave slightly different answers to the function of art. Because um, on one hand, we had said that the role of art was sort of in, instead of to have like a um it was it was to your words were something along the lines of to let 
the machine sort of go to let the, the production just happen on its own. And then on the other hand, we also said it was to break the production. And I'm just a little confused on, it came from two, two different mouths. So maybe there's two different interpretations, but I'm just a little confused here now. Well, you know, it, I think the artist, the art object can do both, right? It can interrupt the flow and break the flow according to them. But the whole idea of flows breaking down is essentially to allow for new things to occur. That's why that's why they say desiring machines work only by breaking down. And, you know, for example, the art object that that's so alien, to, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a really general example here, but, you know, you see a really alien art piece and the art, this art piece is so radically new, it causes old flows to sort of break down. It, or they would say later because now we're in the social field right so it causes deterritorialization and now your flows of desire have moved in different locations by the breakdown of that of, of seeing that object i think oh, okay. um so sort of a one example i'd like to give in terms of art actually that that happened that was a really strange moment it's probably my favorite moment in terms of art history actually <laughs> is that there's a really um underappreciated artist called ad reinhardt who painted um while the whole abstract expressionist movement was going on he was actually part of the abstract expressionist so for any of you jackson pollock clifford still these are you know the real splatter paintings huge masculine um abstract expressionist paintings that are you know you go to the museum of modern art and, and that's you're going to see these mahusive sort of in, you know captured dynamic paintings um and ad reinhardt was painting these five foot by five foot black paintings where he let the paint he would mix i've done it myself before he would mix a whole tube of black paint and then one um like a a thimble of another really dark color and then he'd mix that together so well and let it set for months and then he'd paint a grid of nine of these separate colors on the black. So the only way you can ever properly see these paintings is if you go stare at the painting for at least about 15 minutes and eventually the colors will come through because they're so, um, there's so little difference between them and the actual black that they they take, you can only see them with your eye. And any pictures that are online, they, they've sort of been saturated so the saturation has changed so you can turn it but anyway the point is that one of the very early abstract abstract expressionist shows ad ad reinhardt had a room of these paintings all about seven or eight five foot by five foot black paintings and it was deemed so um controversial that it was actually cordoned off from the public so in one room you've got these really controversial works which which people were confused confused of already by Jackson Pollock, which are obviously controversial because that was the final point where he, where where an artist had finally broke down this sort of final barrier of realism production, this idea that painting in some way had to represent something even in abstract. And Pollock, you know, and other uh, artists, but obviously Pollock's the, fa the, the, the most famous, sort of fa final, finally break through this. But while this extremely controversial and radical thing's going on in one room, this series of productions in the other room there's a schizo there's something so schizophrenic going on that the 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 you know the overtake and the the breakdown of what's going on is so much of a breakdown that there is so little connection to the previous flows that it's just deemed impossible to even to even address it so it's just cordoned off and unfortunately for ad reinhardt this just kept happening and he's still he's still sort of uh relatively understood but in terms of what we're talking about in terms of the breakdown of flows, I just think it's an interesting point that there is a point where I think societal flows can break down where the, the there's such a so little retention of territory that what you begin to deal with is actually absolutely alien and is so absolutely alien that it's sort of frightening. And this is potentially where you could begin to talk about horror. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd add that in. Yeah, I, I think. Wait, were you trying to say something? Uh, Trans Republic, because I noticed your mic just went off right before. So I, one of, I, I or the other person started talking. Uh, I had a quick question about the in the discussion about art a second ago. Um, I joined the the group 
late, um, but you mentioned that we had discussed earlier the fact that there's no sort of distinction between subject and object. Um, what was that? Uh, when, like, what part of the book was that in, in reference to that discussion? So that's interesting to me in the art context. I think it was page one. I think it's the first page of the book where they talk about the unconscious uh, existing. I mean, the, the whole relationship between design and production existing before subject-object dichotomy. Um, okay, great. That's a good place to start. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so there's some lines that I, I think can be interpreted in so many different ways in this book. Like, I, I don't know, some people do. So I think Arto, where they talk about this, they talk about this. I read at the last section of chapter two, but there's a really interesting line with, which actually took me a while. But it, I don't know, it, it's it's. I think it's really interesting to actually see everyone, everyone having a different interpretation on this line. But they say. Like I so said, when they, they're describing, like I think they're describing like William Turner's painting, but they say they also say as art. So I think they're referring to a text that Arto wrote called. It's a really interesting text. It's called Van Gogh, a man who was suicided by society, which is it's it's, it's really incredibly written piece as, as always by Arto. But um, what essentially they start talking about is that they use this quote. And they say it's obvious that there's no point in writing. A, a, I don't know if that's correct, actually. I, I don't know. I struggle to remember it. But they say something. Every As soon as the writer touches the page, every writer is a sellout. And I, I, I think it, it, it has something to say, right? You know, there's certain... You know, there's certain ways that you know, if you if you're writing a book, it's the fact that the that it's, it's the fact that there's a coding that the book always needs to be written in. You know, I think they also in like logic of sense they give the example of James Joyce uh, in Finnegan's Wake going to full like schizophrenic language. But in the sense that, you know, if you're writing a book, oh, well, how is the book encoded as a book? Uh, how, how can you think? I mean, it, it, is it the fact that, you know, does it have to be coded as a book flow as an author? Or can you code it as something differently, right? Is it possible to think of a book in a different way? And it's, 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 it's an interesting interpretation, at least, I, I think. I mean, some people interpret it in the sense, almost like a Marxist sense, where they ask, like, every time you write something, it's it, 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 it's been commodified or something. But I don't, I don't know. I, th I thought it was kind of related to I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole idea that there, there, you never know. I mean, there, there are certain ways of going to places that are so alien. And I like that example that you gave, because, you know, they talk about like Van Gogh not being like not being understood because he was like too ahead of his time, for example. Or they're like, it's, it's the whole idea of, of of like you know they say later on that the decoded flow is the nightmare of every society, in the sense that it it it's it's it, it, it's so radically alien but so new that it's it's it, what they're what they're what they're asking for is such a radical creativity that's almost so alien. Mm -hmm. And this draws us back to this, the, the one of the implicit problems that you know I always find with these this this early section is this idea of like where does this where does this come from and what does where does the new come from because of course as soon as you start saying well this is going to be the future this is the problem of limits and frontiers again and it's the problem that Leotard outlines is if you begin like in all the futures that we're outlining you notice that none of the futures that we're having seem very new because all these futures that we've got now as as lovely as they are and they have very minor aesthetic differences, SpaceX, um, uh, all the sort of the musky and, and, and Bezos futures that we're seeing. These don't seem surprising or new to us because they were already outlined in the 70s and 60s in, in science fiction novels. So the true new is not something that as soon as it's sort of conceptualized, well, that limit has already been broken. It's sort of like a taboo. Once the taboo can be spoken about, well, it's no longer a taboo. It's like once the once you you understand what's on the other side of the wall the wall might the frontier the limit no longer exists because all then that's left is the the sort of the actualization of it and and when we understand this idea of limits in terms of virtual and the actual again not to bring them i know we shouldn't be bringing them in too much but once what once what is understood on the on the other side of a a limit is once that's understood the limit ceases to exist because then the virtuality the, the, the virtuality which allows for the jump to that new frontier then exists within the body of that organs and it's then a potentiality and possibility all that's left is to actualize it so in the sense of sort of an abstraction f frontiers and fr true frontiers and limits are sort of spontaneously created and spontaneously 
destroyed. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got 20, 20 minutes in, uh, 20 minutes left, sorry. Um, yeah, if there's any more questions or, you know, feel, you know, feel free to jump in. Yeah, um, disconnect from the previous conversation, but I had a question. Just, I want to know, get some more clarification on what is anti-production, because I'm not all too clear about what that is. Um, Bill, do you want to take that one? So, uh, I mean, anti-production, they, they, as soon as we, so at least now what we have, what we're given, right. I, I don't want to go super into chapter three because I, I don't want to, I don't want to turn it into such a confusing mess now. Cause I mean, when they start talking about anti-production in chapter three, they're going to look at prim primitive societies, uh, feudalist societies and capitalist societies and how, you know, how they manage debt and how, it, how values and stuff are created. And they're going to relate it to anti-production. But for now, at least the way we can understand anti-production is in the sense that, okay, so we have this, we have, we have, we have desiring production that's making connections, and it's and it's by producing their understanding. The one flow is interrupted, and it, it, another flow is interrupted, and 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 essentially it's the grafting on of these flows onto different products, and it's just that, and that's why they say, and then, and then, and then, and that, at least that's example which I like, and that's given in the book, and what what happens with these is eventually there's something that happens they say that out of nowhere suddenly there's a production of anti-production and what that means is it's a production of a break and essentially what happens is these machines get disconnected and so they start disconnecting and when they get disconnected they start to record on the body without organs and that's why they say the body without organs is the production of anti-production and essentially these these recordings of these of these breaks or disjunctions are what they refer to as anti-production. At least I'm just going to say that's all we need to know so far for anti-production. So it just doesn't get confusing until we reach chapter three, because it takes a much more bigger role in chapter three. Okay, so if I got this correctly, anti-production is just the creation and producing of breaks which pause the productions of machines, like leave gaps in their production. Uh, I don't, I don't know how much I leave gaps, but. Maybe, maybe it's a term, but it's essentially it's 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 essentially it's the production. They use the word disjunction, right? So the fact that okay, fine, maybe gaps in the sense that if you're moving disconnections, right? Maybe that it's the production of a disconnection, and uh, this production is recorded on a body. This this disjunct this disjunction or disconnection is recorded on a body without organs as an a signifying sign of 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 a of a machining connection, and they eventually start forming a code when they get complex into certain degrees. Of, of, of potentials. Okay, I think I get that, yeah. If no one else has any other questions, I have a, another one near, for the University of Minnesota version near the bottom of page 35 when they're describing how the schizo um, conjoins the two aspects of process. A little bit confused upon the first process that they describe where they say the metaphysical process that puts us in contact with the, the demoniacal element in nature or within the heart of earth. I'm confused on to what that means, what this first process is. And in another level, what does demoniacal mean in this context? Wait, sorry. Can you give me the page number again? And near the bottom of page 35 in the schizo, the two aspects of process are conjoined. And they describe the first process as the metaphysical process that puts us in contact with the demoniacal element in nature or within the heart of earth. Just as to what that meant. Um, just why, like, Bill, I think Bill's going to sort of try to tackle that question. Um, so we will come back to that, um, Scrub. Uh, but there's just another question I don't want to miss out because it's just in the chat. Um, Chill or Boris asks, um, related or not to art, what is Deleuze and Guattari's general outlook on phenomenology? either Heidegger or Husserl's. Um, so on page 24, every time that the problem of schizophrenia is explained in terms of the ego, all we could do is sample a supposed essence or a presumed specific nature of the schizo. Regardless of whether we do so with love and pity or disgustedly spit out the mouthful we have tasted, 
We have sampled him once as a dissociated ego, another time as an ego that has not ceased to be, who was there in the most specific way, but in his very own world, though to, to be might reveal himself to be to a clever psychiatrist, a symp sympathetic observer, in short, a phenomenologist. Um, reading that, firstly, made me realise how difficult it is to read Deleuze and Qatari out loud. Um, in terms of their relation to phenomenology, I think that really when we begin to think about how Deleuze and Guattari think about what is considered real, this is where we might see sort of um, criticisms of phenomena as, as seen as this reality, because especially with Deleuze, the processes that we sort of can abstractly think of as going, behind, going on behind the scenes, the ones which are often deemed unreal, these are completely and utterly understood by Deleuze and Guattari as real. So I think perhaps that there, if there was a uh, something that they had to say about phenomenology, of course there'd be a lot that they have to say, and I'm sure you know there's scholarship on it, but it would be in relation to what is considered real and what actually affects us with in, with regards to cause. Um, and that the real process that 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 the processes of desire and the process of production and consumption are real processes. Um, yeah. Okay, but uh, I don't know. I'm not super familiar with phenomenology, but like people like I think Joe Hughes has a really famous reading of reading the laws through these different in repetition through what Hirst wrote later developed in his life called uh, genetic phenomenology. But that's a whole nother story. Um, so actually, this this I think what uh, so what Scrub has asked on page thirty five. Would you guys mind if I read through the whole thing? Because I think we can go through it a little bit slow. We get the whole context out. Okay, go ahead, man. So there is no doubt that at this point in the history, the neurotic, the pervert, and the psychotic cannot be adequately defined in terms of drives. For drives are simply the desiring machines themselves. It's interesting because, you know, they say that when Freud discovered libido before he, you know, the free flowing concept of libido of Freud before he started introducing stuff like Oedipus is they say it's very much similar to the desiring machines they develop. Or another way to read it is like Nietzsche has that famous passage in Daybreak, right? When he talks about walking in a market square and you have a multiplicity of impulses and these certain impulses and drives are di dictating your movement, but it's only the strongest drive where the will to power essentially associates with the ego or the I. And Freud actually was inspired by that passage, I'm pretty sure. But anyways, uh, they must be defi defined in terms of modern territorialities. The, new the neurotic trapped within the residual artificial territorialities of our society and reduces all of them, let's rub out through this, to Oedipus as the ultimate territoriality, as reconstructed in the analyst's office and projected upon the full body of the psychoanalyst. Yes, my boss is my father, and so is the chief of state. And so are you, doctor. Essentially, I think they're talking about they're talking about edipalization here. I think it's pretty obvious that the flows of desire have been moved in certain locales, right? The the conjunctive synthesis when the incorrect use is that is that so that's the incorrect use of the conjunctive synthesis would be something like so that's what I desired. I desired Oedipus. So the pervert is someone who takes the artifice seriously and plays the game to the hilt. If you want them, you can have them. Territorialities, infinitely more artificial than the one the society offers us. Totally, totally artificial new families, secret lunar societies. As for the schizo, continually warning, wandering about, migrating here and there, everywhere at best, he can, he can, he plunges further and further into the realm of deterritorialization, reaching the furthest limits of decomposition of the socius on the surface of his own body without organs. So this is, this is like when they're talking about the schizo revolutionary, right? Essentially that the schizo is able to affirm both, you know, so the schizo, I think according to them, is the only person who, if the psychoanalyst talks about Oedipus, the schizo is the only person who could respond, oh, Oedipus never heard of him, right? It's a really funny line about the pervert, as they understand it, that he's able to affirm both bo bo both the restrictive views and the connective views into something, he, he, into something much more powerful. It's that whole, and that's what they're describing you. He, he, it, it, it may be well be that these peregrinations are the schizo's own particular way of rediscovering the earth. The schizophrenic deliberately seeks out the very limit of capitalism. He is inherent tendency brought to fulfillment. It's surplus product, it's pro proletariat, and it's exterminating angel. 
he scrambles all the codes and is the transmitter of the decoded flow of desire, the real continuous flow. In the schizo, the two aspects of the process are conjoined. So, I mean, before we get into that, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting, I mean, what, how they regard the schizo revolutionary, because I, I think there could be a big misunderstanding here. They say later on in chapter two that, you know, someone can be consciously reactionary, but unconsciously revolutionary, or someone could be unconsciously reactionary and consciously revolutionary. And uh, I mean, this, the whole valorization with Deleuze or the trans evaluation would be to go to the unconscious of what they believe is really happening. Uh, the real continues the flow. In the schizo, the two processes of process are conjoined. The metaphysical process that puts us in contact with the demoniacal element of a nature or within the heart of the earth. So one of the things here, I think what the, their whole notion of the schizophrenic, I mean, so I think, I think in the traditional conventional sense of schizophrenia, you think of someone who's detached from reality. You think of someone outside of reality. You think of someone, someone who's like, oh, he's hallucinating. He's, he's outside of reality. But according to Deleuze and Gattari, under their definition of schizophrenia, Deleuze and Gattari say they are at the very heart of the real. They are at the very heart of reality. They are the very intense part of, the, of what, because they see desiring production as the objective movement of the unconscious, right? That's why they describe it in a very Kantian sense as syllogisms, right? As Kant understood syllogisms as the proper use of the transcendental syntheses. And that's why they think that the schizophrenic obeys like this objective law. And that's why they're so certain that the schizophrenic is experiencing reality for reality itself. They say the schizophrenic is experiencing reality with it, without the forms of social repression because he's able to affirm those and get beyond it. And that, that's why they say, you know, and, and <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and read on. The, the, the heart of the earth and the historical process of social production that restricts the autonomy. So I'll try and read that again. The real continues to flow in the schizo. The two aspects of process are conjoined. The metaphysical process that puts us in contact with the deep uncle element in nature or when the heart of the earth and the historical process of social production that re restores the autonomy of desiring machines in relation to deterritorialized social machines. Schizophrenia is at the is, is desiring production at the limit of social production. So I think that's essentially them saying is that uh, is is that they're able to limit both these both these extremes and they're but they're they're able to take it into the social field, right? They're able to go. That's why they're revolutionary because they're taking it into the social field and actually doing something, doing something with it. And that's why and that's why they say it. They're at the limit of everything. Schizophrenia for them is a limit, but it's it's like the limit of 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 reality in a certain way. I hope that helps. I don't know how it works. Yeah, I'm not really sure I got all that. <laughs> but I, th I think your last question, at least how, at least when I run, ran down to the very bottom, your last question about re about what you were asking about the dem demonical element in nature or within the heart of the earth, I mean, they see desire production as the objective movement of the unconscious. And they see it as the object of the unconscious that's not restricted. I mean, so so things like lack and stuff, yeah, those are very much real. But they're gonna say it's that that's not the objectivity, right? That's lack and stuff are created by social assemblages constructing desire and you know, or manipulating them in social way. I mean, they get in thousand plateaus, they talk about a priest, a priest who comes and says, Give me your desire machines, blah, blah, blah. I mean, in some ways they're using a lot of they, they like to use a lot of flowery language, but what they're saying is that this is the natural way of at least how they understand things. Okay, so it's saying that like these natural unconscious processes of desiring things or feeling lack, that is this metaphysical process that puts us in contact with the demoniacal element in nature, or is it something different? I'm sorry, can you, I, I, so desiring production for them is nature. Desiring production is 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 is, is it's, it's like the most real you can go down to for them. Okay, so that's why it's split between social production and desiring production as the two processes that a schizo conjoins. So social production is is like this molar aggregate of uh, so desiring production. So one of the key theses of this book, and we'll see it as we go through different prehistorical societies. But social production and desiring production are the same thing for them, except we see a distinction between so so like desiring production is like you know sexual production and social production is like working at a factory but they say like you know labor power and libido are the same thing it's just under capitalism that they get so distorted and so thrown around and what they're saying is that what, what they mean by that line is that they're you know the desire and production of the pervert right is able to take 
is about is able to take this and take it into the social field of social production. What makes him revolutionary is he's taken he's he's able to take it not into into only to the limit of sexual production but also to the limit of social production, and essentially in in that sense he he is a revolutionary. Okay, I get it now. That second explanation made it, you know, finally click with me. I got you. But you know, I, I wouldn't worry it too much because you know this this chat you're referring to sex section four. This is, I mean, section four is is really like a condensed version of all of chapter three, and it it gets. I'm I'm pretty sure my explanation also had several errors because I was, you know, there are parts of this book that I think it might have been better to write in a different order, but this gets. You know, it gets significantly more clear, at least for me, it got more clear when I read chapter three. Okay, I think I understand now what these two processes are and how the schizo conjoins them. So I think I got that. On how the schizo conjoins the desiring production and fuses it with social production to become like a revolutionary figure. Um, okay, we have uh, five minutes left here. So if anyone has a sort of a final question that we that they'd like to, to, to you know, talk about, then um, feel free. I just want to read one line from, uh, I think it's from, so I think it's from PH34. Mm -hmm. They say that, the more the capitalist machine deterritorializes, decoding, and axiomatizing flows in order to extract surplus value from, from them, the more its ancillary uh, apparatuses, such as government bureaucracies and the force of the law and order, do their utmost to re-territorialize, absorbing in the process a larger and larger share of surplus value. I thought that was interesting. If anybody wants to Google Portland 2020 and uh, put that next to that line, I think that'd be very interesting. <laughs> It is interesting that um, we sort of see this process where everything, capitalism sort of makes everything liquid and deterritorialized. And then you almost have to have this massive state apparatus come in constantly to try and repair it and try and keep basic things uh, functioning. That was very interesting. Yeah, it certainly seems to be an era where we've, um, we still have the compulsion that in their purest form that these sort of flows are are still emancipatory um i'm a big fan of Deleuze Guattari, but i think that the outcomes that are drawn from their books aren't really the outcomes that they intended in fact i think they're far far from it um and that the outcome that especially the individual outcomes that have been drawn from the post-structuralists have almost been the antithesis of it seems to me of what what's been what what they're really writing about in terms of there has been a creation of further identities and further containment and further constraints which due to their sort of ability to you can really pin down yourself with language you can say i'm you know this 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 this, this and combine them and make them really specific it seems to be liberating but when you actually step back you realize that it's pure forms of constraint and it seems to me that what you're on about in relation to Portland and the politics that have le led us to this place is really sort of a bastardization of these ideas that, that people are moving away from the the, the the forms and flows which Deleuze and Guattari truly wanted to truly wanted to sort of liberate and we're seeing greater um, almost like a really very strange mutated form of Oedipalization where people are just beginning to create their own mini Oedipuses for themselves. What would be some examples of these mini internally created Oedipuses that people create for themselves? Um, that I'm probably not going to give examples because that's just a personal reading. So, but okay. but um, but generally, I just see identity politics as that way as people creating their own isms and ologies very very quickly which are they are able to fit a worldview into but by doing so everything immediately becomes constrained so they it seems emancipatory but what they've actually done is create another form of oedipus and people sort of get left behind in these as politics moves on and 
it seems that what happens is sort of this just trail of um, destruction where things have been created but aren't. The problem with an Oedipal structure is that they they generally, for something to have a coherent Oedipally, it can't really flex too much, which is why capitalism is so important to Deleuze Guattari because it is something that can, um, it is something that is fluid. And that's why it's so important is because it can subsume everything into it and use anything. Um, so, yeah. It's almost like they underestimated its power, even. Oh, what, Deleuze and Qatari? Yeah, it's yeah, almost yeah, like Yeah, I they... think so. I think so. I think they, they overlooked... I th- the, the, bit, the part I specifically think they overlooked is in relation to the alien power. So they make a division where Marx talks about the alien power, which makes someone sort of work in terms of labour. This, this thing that comes in, this, well, alien power, and overtakes man... Deleuze and Guattari have this sort of change of theorization where this alien power is still there. They make some alterations to it, but I don't think they went far enough to see that actually that a- that alien power for Deleuze and Guattari does sort of possess man. But I personally think that they should have gone one further and understood that eventually if capitalism is, is part of the flow for so long and overtakes the flows, that alien power actually becomes man. It becomes part of his very being to be someone who is completely oriented by work, production and labor. And it seems to me funny that they call man the humans desiring machine, or they label people as desiring machines and yet don't come to this conclusion. Um, so, are, any of you, are, any of you, are any of you guys familiar with uh, Gilles Chalet? Oh, is that the yellow vest? Is that what you're saying there? No, no, uh, Gilles Chalet. Sorry, but he said Gilles Jean. I'm sorry. No, no, he wrote a book. I'm sorry, did someone say something? Yeah, um, the mathematician that Deleuze sort of collaborated a bit and wrote is like, I think, I think he, uh, if you've read the whole thing, you could probably elaborate on it. I actually haven't got all the way through it, but he wrote sort of a short, really polemical critique of capitalism. It was like a long, sort of mathematical book, you know, book of philosophy that I picked up recently from that. Yeah, so he wrote a book called. Uh, to, yeah, he was a mathematician. He did a, he, you know, he did a lot of work with people like Gilbert Simon Bon, and he he also has a book on this, on his, on, on on virtuality and stuff. But so he um, he wrote a book called. I think this was much later in the eighties. He wrote a actually I'm not sure, but I forget the date. But he wrote a book called "To Think and Live Like Pigs." I think it was recently published by Urbanomic. But in that, so <clears throat> Andrew Kolb has a book called "Dark Delos," which is essentially how. Deleuze was appropriated in a, at least in a, in a, in a, at least a, today in terms of capitalism. If you if you want to read like the much more interesting version of that, I highly recommend uh, Gilles Chalet's to think and live like pigs, because what that book's about is you know, it's like a critique of all those political theories that. So it's not so much a critique in the sense that they're like, oh, let's rip them about, even though he's like very harsh to people like Deleuze and all those almost like cybernetic uh, political theorists and stuff, but. He, he he has this very interesting idea of how it's been re-territorialized into modernity almost, or how it's been re-territorialized in today. I, I, th- I think it's a more interesting version of what Andrew Culp was trying to do in Dark Delos. Right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, feel free to stay in the chat and chat about it. Um, but I will now update the pin for the next week's reading. Um, but uh, we're we're at the end of the time, um, so thank you all for coming. Thanks very much, and I'll uh, I'll catch you all next week.